from the nation's capital, this is the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast with your host, Rob Snowett. downloading the fly fishing consultant podcast i am still rob snow white this is series two episode 55 i finally get a chance to interview george daniel straight out of central pennsylvania in the home of eastern trout fishing you'll find george often fishing with his family or working in the shop or guiding this is my chance to sit down and ask him some of the questions that i've been meaning to ask him for years. This podcast is brought to you by Risen Fly. All right, so where where are you right now? The state. I'm in Central Pennsylvania at the moment. It's where we currently reside uh, with my with my family. And you also have trout water, like in your backyard. I do. I mean, we live right in Central Pennsylvania, and I'm on. Literally, maybe a, a rock and a half uh, length uh, away, uh, throw length away from my favorite trout stream. So, yeah, so, you know, we have access to water about one minute outside my door. And then in any direction, I have some of the, the best trout fishing in Pennsylvania, all within, you know, 20 to 40, 44, 45 minutes, respectively. So I'm kind of in the thick of things right here. I think that explains a lot about what we're going to talk about today. Uh, so you grew up in that area? I grew up north, just north of here. So I live, I lived right on the Pennsylvania, New York border. So it's, it's a county called Potter County, uh, also known as God's country. It's just, it, it's in the sticks, um, in the middle of nowhere. And that's, what's cool about that spot in that location. It's, it's one of the spots or areas in, in the state that really has never seen any economic boom, uh, so to speak. So what's nice is, when I go back there, it looks the same way as it did, you know, 20, 25 years ago. Uh, it's basically lots of state land, remote, uh, a couple towns, but yeah, just, uh, I grew up in the, in the sticks. So I lived on the headwaters of Kettle Creek called Germania Branch. Uh, there was this little beautiful brook trout stream that flowed right past my, my front door. Uh, that was probably about 30 feet in front of my door. And what was great about it, it was a kids only section and I was the only kid in the entire village. And- <laughs> actually fished so up at, yeah so up until the age 14 I, I had my own private brook trout fishery wow. uh, and it was just a and we were a one car wow. family my father worked up in lower state new york so the summers i had nothing to do but uh get in trouble or go outside and uh spend time on the water or in the woods so it was uh it was probably one of the best experiences i think any kid could have growing up uh, especially if they were interested in the outdoors so what got you just out out there? Was it parental influence or are you just exploring and your parents supporting you? Yeah, my father, my father was the, the, the person that got me interested in fly fishing. He was a very impatient bastard. I had no patience whatsoever, but he at least introduced me into the sport uh, and got me going and took me a few, some spots uh, here and there. But, you know, so he kind of wet my whistle on that front, but it was my mom who really spent a lot of time just, she, she would drive me around, or if I had my Huffy bike back in the day, I think you remember those old little Huffy bikes, I would drive, ride my bike down, uh, you know, four or five miles down and, and fish all the water, and she would eventually pick me up. But she was the one that really kind of nurtured uh, my my love for, and passion for the game. And, and that went on until I was about 14, 15. And then at that, that age, my family relocated because of a job situation down into the state college area where we currently live and and that's really where i got my my formal education growing up you know everyone knew the names joe humphreys and george harvey especially in our area and i basic basically grew up idolizing these guys and eventually when i was 16 i was able to drive ran into the fly shop and finally cross paths with mr humphreys and joe was you know joe was larger than life for me and I was always kind of a shy kid, but I, I ran into the fly shop and finally he was with a large group. I think he was doing a class that day and I had already purchased all his books, both of his books up at that point. But 
I really needed to find an in or a way to create a conversation with him, especially when he had all these people around him. So my my first instinct was to grab both of his books. Uh, so I rebought uh, both of his books and I ran up to him and I said, Mr. Humphreys, if I buy these books, would you sign them for me? And that's kind of how we created a conversation. He sat down with it for a few minutes, talked with me, signed my books and I created uh, basically a contact with him and he, you know, he promised me that, you know, he would take me fishing someday. So basically after about a year and a half of me just hounding him, I mean, contacting him nonstop, calling him nonstop, you know, basically once a week saying, when are we going fishing? He finally gave in. And after a year and a half, he gave in, we went fishing and kind of the rest of the rest is history. He took a liking to me, uh, really gave me some great insights. Uh, but more than anything else, I mean, we spent a lot of time on the water together, but more than anything else, what Mr. Humphreys gave me was encouragement. And when you have anyone that you idolize, you know, if someone that you really look up to, uh, and, and that type of person actually gives you encouragement, says you can do this. If you, you know, follow your dreams, you work hard. I think that's sometimes all the fuel you ever need, uh, to, to accomplish what you, you set out to do. And, uh, I can't thank him enough for giving me that encouragement early on in my life. At what point did George sort of notice that, uh, oh, sorry, Joe, that you were, you know, a little different than other anglers, especially maybe your age, that you were gifted? Or when did you start noticing that? Yeah, I, I don't know. Gifted. I mean, nothing, nothing comes easy to me. Uh, school in particular. You know, almost failing out of high school and college and uh, eventually got myself together and went into grad school and so forth. But everything, uh, you know, athletics, nothing came easy to me. But I think what, what he realized was my work ethic. Uh, you know, we're, when Joe coached, especially me, I mean, it, you have to know a little bit about Joe. Joe was a hard ass. I mean, he, I mean, he, he boxed for the Navy. He wrestled for Penn State. He's just one of these really intense guys, especially in his younger age. I mean, he's 88 years old now. He seems like a really sweet old man. But even up to about 20, 25 years ago, he was he was hardcore. And when he took me fishing or he had me do casting lessons, he was intense. I mean, he was a drill instructor. And I think some people, you know, when they get that type of instruction, they kind of say, you know, th- you know, this isn't what I signed up for. And they kind of they want the easy path. But. You know, after, you know, I don't want to say beat down and after beat down, but after each session with Joe, I kept coming back with more and more questions. And I think that's kind of, that's what kind of kept him, uh, kept his interest peaked in me because I just, I was hungry for more and more. And and he realized I wanted this more than anyone else. And I think that's what kind of kept him uh, helping me out along the way. That's interesting. But he was really that dedicated into teaching you fly fishing i don't i don't say it's a sport it's a way of life it's the way i see it um absolutely and do you definitely think not a sport uh, his active lifestyle in his youth is why he's still so active today oh absolutely you look at guys like i mean even george george harvey i think he lived up into his uh, late 80s but joe is also 88 uh look at lefty you look at all these guys i think you know people that there's a great saying that people that retire early die early and you know, people that lose, you know, so much to what they do in their life is and once they lose that element, they kind of lose their purpose. But, you know, when you have an activity like fly fishing or, or any sort of pursuit, you know, it doesn't matter if you're retired, you have a purpose. You, you stay engaged. And I think the thing about Joe and Lefty and all these guys, the secret to their success is in their long livelihood is one is that they had this hobby. But then two is, is the circle of friends and the great people that you surround yourself with, especially when you talk about fly fishing. I think those two elements keep these guys alive and it's just, it keeps them involved mentally and physically. And I think that's, I think that's the key to any, you know, long, healthy life. Absolutely. So when did you start working at, in the fly industry? Yeah, Joe, Joe got me started. I mean, really, you know, at age 18, um, you know, I started doing like clinics and workshops and, you know, one of the cool things about Joe is, again, I, I mean, I still idolize him, but, you know, Joe would go on to the shows. I would go to like the Somerset Fly Fishing Show when I was in high school and college, and I would see him present and talk. And I just looked at him just like, this is, I mean, this would be the coolest thing, be able to travel around the country or the world and, and do the presentations. And what was cool is 
I would get like a sneak peek, uh, kind of like a, uh, of his video presentations. So before he would go to these shows, he would show me his presentations, which at that point were video format. He was one of the first guys to incorporate video into his presentation. So at his house, you know, he we would sit down. His wife Gloria, who's no longer with us, but she would make us like a, a toasted cheese sandwich and some hot chocolate or hot Ovaltines to what they like. Mm-hmm. And we would sit down, have a have have a snack and he would go over his entire presentation uh, with me before anyone else saw it. And that, I mean, that was cool. And what, he, and what he saw that I also wanted to do that eventually do presentations. He helped set me up uh, with local uh, Clearwater organizations and, you know, local TU chapters. I would do everything for free. And, and to be honest with you, I was so excited. I mean, there were a couple programs and presentations when I was 19, I mean, I drove five hours one way just to do it for free, uh, just because I was so excited that there was actually someone willing to, to listen to my BS for a few minutes. So Joe, Joe kind of got me started you know, working in the industry on that front early on. I started doing some guiding on and off throughout college, uh, worked for the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission doing stream restoration, and uh, eventually went to graduate school, uh, Penn State, and then I, I really wanted to teach college. Education was kind of my passion. I just, you know, I just love the environment uh, of education and learning. But higher education, once I was a graduate student, really realized I wasn't into that type of scenario. I just, I wanted something uh, a little, you know, a little more focused. And fly fishing was my thing. So fly shop, TCO fly shop, came around. Coincidentally, right at the time when I was getting out of graduate school, they offered me a, a full-time position, and, and uh, we kind of went from there. Where is the shop located? Still is? This shop, yeah, shop. I mean, they have a couple locations, but the shop I was responsible for working, at first assistant manager, then I ended up managing it for a year or two, was State College location. What does TCO uh, stand TDC. for if you're not uh, from around the East TCO. Coast? Yeah, TCO. Yeah, so a lot of people think of it as they always call it TFO, you know, like we love your rods. I, I we used to get these phone calls like love your rods, but uh, TCO is Temple or Topa Hawk and Creek Outfitters, uh, which is a stream that flows through the town of Reading, uh, Pennsylvania, Southeast Pennsylvania, and that's where uh, Tony Gimmon okay. uh, was uh, the owner and started TCO back in the I think 1990. But since, since then, he's opened up several locations, and now I think he has five brick and mortar stores. So a very breaches. successful. Uh, yeah, so the, right. the old Yellow exactly. Breacher store is now TCO. Haven't been up there yet. I haven't been to Pennsylvania to fish in a long time. Speaking of Pennsylvania, you, you guys, is it just the the geology, the hydro? It's you have different water in Pennsylvania that allows for these trout to grow. Yeah, so we have a. It's like a mixture of like spring and limestone, but basically it's the geology. You know, the water uh, coming up from the headwaters into the geology, going to the limestone, which just creates a, a nutrient rich environment for both insects and trout. Uh, so it's just, uh, you have the nutrients, but then also you have the, uh, the water temperatures. I mean, the temperatures are regulated. So normally they don't get too cold in the winter and usually they don't get too hot in the summertime. It just, it provides a 365 fishery. I wish we had that here. <laughs> I wish you guys did too. Cause it would take a lot of the pressure off from the, the Virginia and Maryland crowds. In my youth up here. I mean, I used to drive up there all the time. Gas was cheap. I was single. Yeah, not anymore. Things have changed. <laughs> all right, so from there, you went into – what? how did you get into competitive fly fishing? It's so a I whole was, other type of fishing that you were introduced to. It was. It was It was something that I wasn't – I was kind of forced into doing uh, from my wife and a friend of mine. It was just – the first competition I entered was the OLM, which at that point was the Outdoor Life Network, Fly Fishing Masters. It was a TV station, but there was a qualifier. You know, they, they were doing this national event where they had qualifiers in each of the four geographic regions in, in the United States. And State Col- or Spruce Creek was one of those locations. And a friend of mine got wind of it and just uh, wanted me to join. Um, and I was reluctant. My Him and my wife kind of persuaded me after, you know, about an hour or two. And. I agreed and I got into it, uh, did fairly well, you know, and then um, kind of it just kind of stoked my interest for uh, in competition fishing for a little bit. I, I'm not an overly competitive guy when it comes to fly fishing, but 
I like the environment. Uh, it's I guess you could say it's kind of an adrenaline rush. Uh, you just it just creates this rush of uh, adrenaline that uh, I, I've never gotten on a fly fishing before. And whether you like it or not, uh, it gave me that rush. But then also it's what I what I liked about that you know the that which also led to the U.S. fly fishing team, and I was on there for a number of years and coached both the youth the youth and the adult was really I love surrounding myself with just great people you know and you know the more good people you surround yourself with i mean the better you become and you know there's a, there's a theory it's called the fly you know, the five chimps theory i was listening to on, on some podcast and another uh, lifestyle podcast but the idea is that the, the five people that you surround yourself with you become more of the the average of those five people and my theory in competitive fly fishing was if i could surround myself with really some of the anglers in the united states it would take my game up to the next level. That that was kind of the, the real motive behind competitive fly fishing was really the environment and the, the learning curve I observed uh, during those years on the team. So what I see is you were honed by Joe Humphreys. You got to work in a shop. You grew up exploring, and then you did the competitive. Is that's that's pretty much what you know kind of molded you. Um, you know, experiences yeah. that. Other yeah, people absolutely. Yeah. aren't gonna gonna get. So that's what I wanted to know about. Like, um, so when you go fishing, when you write your books, to be so successful, um, what sort of techniques and methods have you developed that sets you apart? Um, so I, maybe I want to oh, start I, with uh, like what ro- I'll just go down. You know, rods, leaders, flies. Like, what kind of what's your rod of choice? So. Whether whether we like it or not, I mean, we we live in a specialized world. So before, you know, I, I really I try as much as I can to become a minimalist. Try to find like one or two rods that can do a little bit of everything. But with these rods, I mean, the rods that you know, there are rods, there are lines that there are pieces of equipment designed to do very specific things. So most of the time, you know, I, I still nip. I, I nip the majority of times because that's what it usually takes to catch a fish. So the rods that I'm fishing now are are two types. One are just, you know, one, they're, they're both longer rods, normally about 10 foot in length, but I, I have a, a specific rod that I like to fish, you know, like the Orvis Recon. Uh, it's a 10 foot three weight, but it's a softer action rod specifically designed for short range nymph fishing. And then uh, I have a 10 foot four, a uh, little slightly at faster, at faster action rod that I can throw indicator rigs, dry flies and so forth. So most of the time, I find myself using those two rods uh, to handle most of the conditions back home, uh, especially when you're talking about nymph fishing. And then you've developed – when I flip through your book, there are leader formulas that you don't get by just going out a couple times. I mean, you've put the work in to figure out what leader lengths you need for all these specific, I guess, types of water you're fishing. Yeah. How did you come? Is just practice, research, R and D. Yeah, a little bit of everything. Tested. I mean, definitely. Yeah, field tested. But you know, one is, you know, as I, as they say, if you ask 10, 10 of the top nymph anglers what their favorite leader formulas are, you're gonna get ten different answers. But it was just kind of talking to people myself, finding out what the leaders that they like, and create a baseline for me. And then lots of it was just R and D. I mean, just time on the water and just checking things and, and, and making, you know, keeping things that work for me and taking things off that didn't work for me. And, and I think, you know, my, my approach to education and, and teaching and writing, I mean, I write for more of the intermediate to advanced. And I'm not saying that because, I, you know, I'm a snob towards those people, but, you know, there are, when I teach, you know, I, I look at people in two ways, one that are complete beginners. And when you have complete beginners and, and people like that, like my books are not designed for complete beginners. People, um, you know, I can tell with some of the, 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 the comments I get on Amazon review or even just people when they talk to me at a show, sometimes they feel like the book is a little disorganized. And for a beginner, it is de- disorganized. So when I have a, when I have a complete beginner, I, you need to kind of restructure. I, I will give them specific guidelines saying, okay, this is exactly because they need, they need that structure. They need that foundation to start off with. So I will give them kind of a precise formula to kind of get them started. But as you and I both know, it doesn't matter if you're nymphish or fly fishing, there is no specific formula because on the water because every water type you fish every day is different. 
So what I what I love doing is is just prescribing, you know, just thoughts and ideas and concepts, ideas that go through my mind, the way I troubleshoot ideas. So there's no precise formula, but instead there are uh, maybe a, a large checklist of items that go through my mind that I think about when I'm trying to troubleshoot situations and scenarios on the water. And and that's why I think my books in, in my writing and the way I teach is more geared towards people that already have that foundation, that nymphing foundation, and then can kind of take it to the next level and, and begin looking at uh, positively or negatively their their outcome do you have a brand preference for the leader material you use you know no i'm i'm a human guinea pig you know i really am i mean you know i'm always experimenting you know and that's one of the good things about being out of the comp scene is you know when you when, you, when you're comp fishing you learn is, a is lot that but comp you get, fishing you, is that how it's referred to on the circuit that's like the slang correct <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So sorry about that. But I mean, you learn a lot, but you have a very, very narrow focus. So when you find something that works, you kind of work with it and kind of keep honing it. But what I what I've liked about getting out of the comp the competition scene was actually just experimenting with everything. You know, uh, I'm just a, a connoisseur of uh, podcast, everything fly fishing related. So anytime I, I read an article or I always I would probably say about 80 percent of the time. These things that I try and experiment with, they're really not any better. But once in a while, you, you get that 20%, you know, those two out of 10 times that really kind of help uh, take you to the next level. So with my leader formulas, no, it's, it, you know, I, I don't have a preference because the, the funny thing is you catch fish with all of them. Um, you know, so I, I can't say that I have a particular preference. The one thing I would say is if I'm, if I'm fishing in the den of winter time, where there's a high probability that the only thing I'm going to be catching fish on is nymphing, then I'm going to I'm going to build leader formulas that are specifically designed for nymph fishing. In short, you know, in the spring now, in the next month or two, in central Pennsylvania at least, we're going to start seeing some blueing olives, more intense midge hatches, maybe a few caddis, and so forth. So, you know, in March, in the early part of April, there's a chance I could. Fish nymphs in the morning and then fish dries in, in the late morning, early afternoon. In, in those situations where there's a possibility you can do a little bit of everything with, I'm going to fish, I'm going to build leader formulas that allow me to have one leader that I can do everything with uh, throughout the course of the day, even the fish stream or so. I kind of base my leaders and, and my designs based on what I plan on doing with for the day, if that makes sense. Yeah. You're kind of like the MacGyver of fly fishing. Well, your, well your mind, thank you. I, I, yeah. yeah. The way your mind works when you're doing all that. All right. Um, I want to talk about flies because when I read your articles in the magazines, you will have like six or seven image plates of the way your boxes are not just organized by its color, size from, you know, biggest to smallest or from lightest to darkest. Uh, well, first off, do you, you tie your own flies. I would I probably tie about 90% of my flies. There's a few flies I can tie streamers, you know. I, I'm a I'm a good tire. I mean I, I I tie every day basically, but there are some patterns, you know, like on the streamer fronts, you know, like the drunken disorderly with the deer hair. I mean, I can tie deer hair fairly well, uh but it takes me, you know, considerably longer. So it really pays for me to pay, you know, pay guys like Mike Schmidt or Pat Cohen or, you know, uh like Rich Strollis, guys like that, I'd rather pay them money uh, to, to tie flies for me. That's going to, you know, basically it's, it's going to save me money because the amount of time it takes me to tie these flies, I can spend a hundred bucks and get a, a year supply of flies from them. Right. So on that front, I, I buy flies, but all, basically all my nymphs and dry flies. Yeah, I do tie. I remember you mentioned Rich's name a lot at the Western North Carolina show two years ago about yeah, his absolutely. streamers. Yeah. You know, it's, I think one of the, the biggest BS things in fly fishing is, you know, and there are some people that I think are open minded, but what gets me is people that design their flies, that, that, that design their own flies, which is great, but the patterns. Uh, and to me, I mean, like about nymphing skills, I have a very limited viewpoint on nymphing because it's just, it's my experience. 
And I think what's great about, you know, being able to experiment and fish with other people's patterns is that you get to see that people design patterns for specific situations, you know, like Rich Stroll and I have a, a pattern of similarity. We love using floating fly lines and, and most, a lot of his flies are heavily weighted like the headbanger sculpin that are designed to be fished on a floating fly line. Or if you talk to guys like Tommy Lynch, you know, that fishes the Michigan rivers, he fishes the drunken disorderly on a, on a sinking fly line. But what they are doing is is they are developing patterns to solve particular problems, you know, problem solving basically. So what's great is everywhere you go, all these pattern are, are these designers are design patterns to solve their unique fits, their their own problems. And what I love doing is just being able to pick and choose from all these people uh, and their fly patterns. And I think sometimes people just get it stuck into this rabbit hole where they they only fish their own patterns. And and that's why I. I try. I will try to develop some of my own patterns, but for the most part, I really rely on people like, you know, Rich and Pat Cohen and all these guys to uh, pick and choose some of their best patterns and use them uh, to my advantage. And let them do all the hard work, figuring it all out, and then exactly. you get to reap the rewards. Exactly. I mean, you know, fly designs. Until you know, you know, there's very few guys like you know maybe John Barr, maybe Charlie Craven that have been able to make a, a pretty good livelihood, you know, with just the, the royalty of a fly sale. So until that day changes where you can make, you know, millions of dollars with uh, design fly patterns, I'm going to let everyone else do the work and just kind of reap the benefits on the stream. Absolutely. <laughs> the George Daniel podcast is brought to you by risen fly quality fly fishing gear that will rival the big companies but keep some extra money in your pocket. Rods, reels, lines, accessories, and so much more. Try their silver brass beads. They are my absolute favorite. Use promo code SNOWWHITE for 15% off your next purchase. Risenfly.com for more information. Uh, so when you, do your fly boxes look like the ones, like the ones in the photos? Are those what you so, fish with or that is that for photographing? So, no. Uh, back in the day when I was in the competition scene, I had my boxes were very well organized, specifically designed for weight. And just, you know, what you need to understand in the competition rules, long story short, you're not allowed to use split shots. You're not allowed to use supplemental weight like putty. So all the weight had to be building your flies. So when you're com competing, you have to have, especially, you know, as as Joe will tell you, Mr. Humphreys, he'll ask you, he'll say, what's the difference between a, a great nymph fisher and a, and a good nymph fisher? And you're like, what? And he says, two split shot. But with, you know, with competition fishing, it's being able to fine tune your rig. When you're not getting down to where you need to be, you need to make an adjustment usually with your flies. So when I was competing, I had to have a very structured and organized box of flies that were, you know, f filed specifically to small increments of weight. Today, you know, I don't follow those rules as much. You know, I like to think as a like an evolution of fly fishing that I, I try to simplify things. And because uh, I have to use sold way of fly, that I can use like lead shot or you know, non caustic lead shot with tungsten putty. What I can do is I can carry far fewer flies with me and uh, use whenever I need to add weight or take weight off. I can use that supplemental weight to uh, be my variable in weight adjustments. So I have long story short. I've really have reduced the number of flies I carry on on me on the stream to the point now where I have a, a CNF flip flip box that I have on a lanyard. I can carry up about 200 flies, but when I fish by myself, that's all I carry. I have that lanyard with about 200 flies, a couple packs of split shot, a variety of indicators, uh, and that's basically it. When I'm guiding, it's my job to make sure that if there's any unique situation at, on hand, I, I have to have a pattern or something for that so i'll carry you know maybe a couple thousand flies on me when i'm guiding but when i'm fishing on my own i've really become a minimalist but 200 flies tops and that's all i need is there any pattern you can't live without so yeah so two patterns specifically that i've been using lately uh one is an old school pattern, you know, and I bounce back and forth between unweighted and weighted patterns. So right now with the unweighted patterns, it's an old school pattern called the Ray Charles. And in central Pennsylvania, you know, with the limestone Spring Creek influence, we have a very healthy population of freshwater shrimp and, and crest bugs. So that Ray 
Ray Charles, which I'm surprised very few people know about it because, you know, 20, 25 years ago, it was one of the hottest patterns out there. But it's just three strands of uh, ostrich churl, you know, palmered around the hook shank, clipped on the top, and then you have a, a, a thin layer of mylar tinsel pulled over top as a wing case and tied down. But uh, for a crest bug pattern, that's my number one pattern to go to. And then one of the patterns I've been playing a, around with a lot came from a friend of mine. It's called uh, Higa's SOS. So that's Spencer Higa. It's an Orvis pattern, but it's just a an attractor pattern. Simple just little, a, a, little a, a flat, Yeah, correct. Like a, a size 16, uh, but just a, what they call the SOS. And that those two patterns, you know, I, I recycle through patterns from time to time, but Within the last year, those have been my two go-to patterns. Uh, what about – do you use indicators or you – No, feel like- absolutely. Yeah. No, you know, again, in competition fishing, no manufactured indicator allowed. But now, you know, it's funny. You hear these people say, well, I only use tight line nymphing or I only use suspension tactics or indicators. You, know, you have all these tools available. And it's just there are times, you know – if I can get within 20, 25 feet of my target, most of the time I'm, I'm using uh, a tight line system because I just feel it, it provides you a more direct contact between you and your flies. But, you know, if you have a windy day where your wind's being blown all around or if you have to cast further than 20, 25 feet, I use indicators as well. Uh, so I use both uh, nonstop. I just, you know, whenever the condition uh, calls for a, a different technique or a change of plans, I change, so I'm not set in stone. Uh, and I think the best nymph fishers out there, or best fly fishers in, in general, are ones that find the tools best for the, the, the given conditions. So my current problem with indicators, I use the thingamabobbers. Uh, mm-hmm. My five-year-old daughter takes them and uses them in her playroom with like her Barbies and Shopkins, and I can never find my indicators. I don't know how she finds them, like if she goes through my gear. But they're all gone. So if I need indicators, I have to go into the playroom and like knock over 150 Shopkins to look for the my indicators. <laughs> yeah, I understand. That's that's a. I have the same situation. I have a, I have a six and an eight year old, but uh, even at age three and four, <clears throat> there was some attraction uh, with young kids and the Thama boppers. So I don't know what it is, but it's there. When uh, I used to have, you know, I drive around a lot with rods <clears throat> rigged up. And she would grab the thingamabobber when, like, the rod was over her, and she'd try to, like, grab it with her mouth. And I don't maybe it's from her childhood. She's like a shiny little thing. <laughs> She's like a little animal. All right, so, Good times. Um, when did you decide to start putting your experiences into writing and say, you know, I want to be a, a magazine writer? And then at what point were you like, I'm going to put this down between, uh, you know, covers on a book? Uh, sure. You know, I never, I still don't consider myself of a, a writer. I'm more of a technical writer more than anything else. But, you know, if you were to ask my, my English high school teacher or my English college professors that I was going to be writing a book, they probably would have laughed their ass off and maybe laughed you out of this podcast. But it wasn't until 2000, I think, nine, uh, when uh, Jay Nichols, who was, you know, uh, who's a publisher uh, for Headwaters and also acquires projects for Stackpole Books. And, and after one of my presentations and just, I guess, like the way I present information on the technical front and, and asked me if I would be interested in, in maybe writing a, a book for him. And it kind of went from there. And at first, I, I would have to say my, my writing was sketchy. It's just, uh, again, it's, it's very technical on that sense. But, you know, the first the first time writing the the book was painful. I mean, I essentially rewrote the book four times. Uh, it was just a, a long drawn out process. And then I'd like to think I'm getting a little better. Uh, so my streamer book that I wrote strip set that just came out you know, last year or a year and a half ago, uh, I, I only had to write once. And I just, yeah, you know, I, I, you know, I think in order to write, to be a better writer, I started doing a lot more reading and I also found uh, references and resources on writing, you know, one of the, the best resources on writing I came across was on, uh, Stephen King on writing. That was his book. Uh, part of the book was about his life, you know, his life, you know, and, and growing up. But then the second half of the book is actually about his philosophy and, and how he likes to write uh, and, and things like that. Uh, resources like that have really helped me along the way. And now I'm working on a, a third book project right now on uh, nymph fishing because there's so much on 
the dynamic in the team book. A lot of it based on competition. Uh, now I'm, I'm kind of talking about, you know, nymphing without the rules. With, you know, basically, now that I'm on the competition fishing, you know, looking at all the tools that are available to the fly fisher today and, and finding those tools and, and building them into the, a better program. So so that's kind of the progression of my, my writing over the last couple of years. Uh, it's just uh, I enjoy it. You know, as you know, it's fly fishing is such a small market. You're never going to make a lot of money. So until Oprah puts me on her book of the month club, I, I don't really expect to be able to retire off the book royalties and, as a friend of mine once said, who also, you know, a, another author, you know, if we were actually put the time and money that we spent into writing this book, we'd probably be better off just working part time jobs as a greeter at Walmart. So it's <laughs> it's a it's a labor of love. You know, what I what I like about the book projects is just it's it's problem solving for me. So every time I go on the water, I work with a, a client. There's always questions that come you know that come about. And, you know, sometimes I can answer those questions and then sometimes I struggle to answer those questions and being able to help my clients. So I just I think, you know, my the way my brain thinks is I'm always thinking about better ways of explaining how to approach it. You know, there's engineers, there's poets and just and just trying to be able to explain these situations in, in both contexts. Do you have like a little author's nook in your house where you're typing late at night while the kids are sleeping? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I'm more of a morning. Yeah, I'm more of a morning guy. But uh, before the kids get up, so I usually get up around four, get a little workout in, and then uh, get writing before the family wakes up. So yeah, I have I have a little nut, but I I have you know I have a writing pad. I'm always writing notes on. I have my iPhone. Uh, I'm always taking notes on as well. So there, every time I listen to a podcast or write a book, and I hear something that just jars my interest. I take a note down and, and, and just go from there. Or again, every time I'm on the water, you know, what I like is I like getting my rear end, my ass kicked half the time. And, and th- those situations where I'm getting, you know, pummeled by the, the stream or the fish, it's just I write about it, I think about it, and try to go uh, approach it uh, with, a, with a different approach the next time I'm on the water. That's what I like about guiding is every client trip, there's something new and something different that needs to be figured out or that just a new question comes up it's not like going to the office and you're you're doing the same thing every day like punching papers or um, yeah you're exactly right i mean there's a huge difference between you know because i worked retail in the fly fishing industry which is basically a walmart with fly fishing goods on the you know it's still retail but you know as much as i like the retail end of things it was it's almost like groundhog's day especially like in in the month of may the number of phone calls how is Spring Creek or the sulfurs on the water yet? I mean, I would answer that same question 40 times uh, in, a, in, a, in the course of a day where it felt like, you know, you were on, in the movie Groundhog's Day. But you're exactly right. on When you're guiding, every angler comes from it with a different approach. Uh, they have different expectations. The water is always different. Fish are behaving usually in, in a different manner from day to day. And so it's just it's exciting to me because it just keeps it fresh. Uh, it keeps me very much engaged in what I'm doing. So you've got now, how many books have you, you've written two? You said third on the way. Third on the way. I'm working uh, now with, uh, with Jay Nichols. So we're going to, I'm going to start entering the, the world of the, the video market. So I'm going to start doing some videos, uh, some instructional videos as well, which I think is very long overdue, but I just have been waiting for, you know, instead of just throwing, some garbage out there. I kind of, I needed to wait until I found the right people, uh, to put a quality product together. I think, uh, in the next year or two, I'm going to be releasing a couple DVDs on nice. tactics, uh, nymphing, uh, drive fly streamers. And so forth. Which magazines do you write for? Uh, I'm, I'm a contributing editor to fly fisherman magazine. I've written for American angler, fly tire, Magazine, but uh, I'm, you know, I, I guess you could say I'm very loyal to Fly Fisherman. So most of my stuff appears in Fly Fisherman. You know, it, it's once or twice a year. I don't, I have an opportunity to write a lot more, but you know, I, I don't like writing on deadlines. I don't like having, you know, have to write four articles a year. Whenever I have a, a thought or you know something I'm really passionate about writing, I will you know, approach Ross or someone at the magazine and say, you know, I would like to write about this, and we go from there. But uh, I only write when I really get inspired, uh, not because I have a deadline. 
deadlines are no fun. I mean, I've got the deadline to clean the house today. <laughs> and my wife's in Florida. Yeah, She's yeah. drinking Vino Verde, looking over the Gulf of Mexico on Tarpon Drive at our friend's house yesterday. I was like, you got to be kidding me. And well, the next hopefully week, she'll come back. Yeah, yeah she won't yeah, bring she, me anything. She'll have, she'll have a good food. Yeah, and then she goes well, to Singapore well, well, on she, Sunday. I'm like, thanks. Leave me with the kid for two weeks. Um, <laughs> so speaking of kids, how did you get you – know, on Instagram, your kids are smiling all the time, holding fish, often a lot of big fish. Um, was it just natural for them to start fly fishing? You didn't have to, like, bribe them with – and I, you know, I'll promise to take my daughter out for pizza or a burger or something if she goes fishing. No, I think, you know, right from the very start, my wife and I run the lines, you know, and, and I'm not trying to offend people, but, you know, we look at some people that we know and friends, they, they get, you know, basically they let the kids kind of run the show uh, and let, basically they become you know, soccer moms and soccer dads where they get their kids involved with activities. And then for the next six months, they're traveling all over the Northeast, spending thousands of dollars and uh, on travel hotel rooms and taking their kids to soccer leagues. Uh, and they're miserable. We, I, it's the parents are mis- always complaining about getting up on Saturday to drive 40 miles in a November rainstorm to yeah. go stand outside while their kid plays soccer. Like that doesn't yeah, sound I like think- fun. Yeah, and, and sports are very important. I mean, you know, our kids will be involved in sports in some capacity, but not on that level. Sports are very good, I think, from a team to understand how a team works, work ethic. I mean, it basically sports kind of kept me from flunking out of high school uh, in my earlier years. But, you know, my wife and I agree early, early on that we were going to make them part of our life. So right from the start, I mean, we had Kelty backpacks. So as soon as they were, you know, old enough to go outside, uh, you know, six, seven months old, I had a Kelty backpack and, and we were taking them and we got them in fresh air right from the very start. And that's why we bought a house where we did in the country where we can, we have, you know, small two acres, but we also have a stream. So we're out there every day. So right from the very start, they were introduced uh, into this outdoor activity and, you know, the, the key with anything is, is making it fun. And that's the part my wife does. My wife is very good at making things fun. So, you know, at first we would start fishing, you know, for 15, 20 minutes, maybe get them into a couple fish or so. And then when they started like weighing their, you know, getting, you know, interested in fishing, you know, my, my wife would, you know, start throwing rocks, but doing all kinds of outdoor activities, packing snacks, but just making it fun for the kids. Uh, and then the most important part about teaching kids how to fish is, the biggest mistake I see with parents is that they plan on fishing too, which you can't do that. So for each of my kids, you know, as much as I like to fish, the, the first six months I worked with both of my kids, I never fished whatsoever. Uh, I was on the water with with them nonstop, but I did not fish because when you fish, when you plan on fishing, you let your your child go by themselves, they get tangled, and then you're you, you, you just get pissed off because you're trying to fish and, and try to work with it doesn't you can't do two things at one time you gotta focus so the one thing I would say I'm proud about with my with my myself is that I just discipline myself to just say for six months this is all about them I'm gonna get them with a strong foundation and focus on making them a better angler which we did and, and now I take them out west every year I mean two years ago I took my daughter out west uh, for four weeks I took my son out for five weeks last year and then I'm doing another trip for six weeks this this year. We're gonna we're gonna drive out and they're gonna spend the entire summer out uh, out west with me. Uh, that's awesome. Waking up, going in the park, and and that's kind of I think uh, you know I think it's something that they're gonna remember for the rest of their lives. And I just don't want to miss that opportunity uh, to spend time with them and my wife. How'd you get them into tying flies? Because I'm trying to get my daughter to start doing some production tying for me. <laughs> you know, like, give me, I need three dozen well, buggers yeah, by first, sunset. Yeah. <laughs> but no, it's just arts and crafts. It's what it is. So make things fun for them. Same thing with fly time. So they see me time flies usually by a half hour, you know, 45 minutes of every day. And so I have same thing with fly fishing. We start out with 10 car rods so they have their own equipment, which I think is very important. It, it creates a sense of ownership and responsibility. And same thing with fly fishing with the fly time. They have a vice. They have a little Tupperware container with their names on it and tools and equipment. So that's that's theirs. 
uh, and there's a pride of ownership there, and and now they are excited to to tie their own flies. And you know, it's not something that they do every night, but uh, with fly time. But we, especially with school, but we make it a point at least once once a week they're tying their own flies. And every day they're on, they're actually outside, at least getting 15, 20 minutes of fresh air before they come in and do their homework. That's awesome. Do they have any like named fish you can see in the water? Like we can't catch that fish. That's our, you know, pet trout. No, unfortunately, yeah, unfortunately, the stream that I live on, these fish are, which is one of the, it's one of the more challenging rivers. There's no Henry or, or, or Ed down there that we know of consistently. It's just like, once in a while, we'll see him uh, or her, but uh, mo- more often than not, it's just we, we locate another fish uh, from time to time. But there, there's very little consistency behind our house is what I'm saying. So uh, no pet fish as of yet. But maybe as they get better, uh, better than their old man, maybe they're able to, to dial into the, their local fishery and figure out and develop a, a better relationship uh, on a daily basis with some of these fish. How often do you all just kind of observe and not fish? Just like sit out, watch the bugs, watch the, you know, the read some water, just watch the ripples. If I had my wife does that, I I have a bench out there and just sit and watch. Uh, We have a bench, we do. And my wife is her background is like environmental interpretation, so that's what she's very good at. I mean, they pick up rocks, they you know, they look at insects, so. You know, they're playing with all the macroinvertebrates, the stoneflies, mayflies. Uh, my wife is, you know, pretty good in tree identification, bird identification. So when they go out with her, they, they get uh, a natural history uh, session every time. And you've got the Flycraft boat. Is that thing as awesome yeah, as it I looks? Do. It is. You know, it's, uh, you know, I'm partial. You know, I'm definitely a little biased since I'm on their staff. But it's, it's, it's one of the few products in fly fishing where I actually approached the manufacturer and said, I need to get on your staff because uh, I, I love this product. But it's it's great. You know, I've, I've driven across the country once on a Subaru, the second time on my F-150, but I've driven on the on top of my vehicle across the country uh, two times. I've taken it I mean, I've taken on almost every imaginable body of water. I mean, there's a limitation. You can't take anything, you know, class three rapids and beyond. It's off limits, but anything up to, you know, up to class two, it's fantastic. I've I've drifted my wife, my son, on all the waters of Pennsylvania. We've gone down to South Holston. We've done Arkansas, White River, the Yellowstone, the Bighorn, you know, the Provo in Utah. But we've we've taken it everywhere. It's fantastic. And what's nice about it, it's a small, you know, you look at this compared to some other manufacturers. It's it's compact. One, uh, the hull design is very easy to use. My wife actually has one now. She liked it so much, she wanted one. So we would buy just for her so we could take the entire family out but it's so she we she learned how to row within two days uh using the boat and it's just if you want to break it down it, it comes in compartments you can fold it into like a two by two area you can stick it in the back of the car it takes about 10 minutes to assemble once you have the, the the system in place but yeah it's a it's a fun boat it's really had you know it's allowed us in the summertime to spend a lot of time in the water because kids and boats, kids love boats. So in the summer, I, I spend most of the summer out west or on the local river here in the west branch of Susquehanna, just floating my kids. We'll do snorkeling. We'll do some bass fishing, carp fishing, and we'll also spend a, a lot of time uh, snorkeling. But we do all of that off our flycraft boats. So cool. Do the kids row? No, not yet. So not that's, yet. Uh, that's, you know, that's phase two. So it's just, it's just slow progression, but uh, I, you know, I definitely have plans for them down the road to uh, reciprocate all the help that uh, mommy and daddy have done for them with the rowing. That's awesome. All right, couple more questions. Let you get back. Uh, explain what a goat rope is again. Y- you mentioned goat, goat rope. rope I mean, it, yeah. Oh, yeah. So goat that? rope is a it, it's a political term, but it's a it's a political term used you know in politics, but. From a fly fishing standpoint, it's using heavy rope. I mean, a goat can't even break. So when you're talking about streamer fishing, you know, like Gary LaFontaine said, people talk about, you know, trout being positive thinkers, like glass half full type of mentality. Because if trout could actually see and were really discriminative about what they chose in food, I mean, three quarters of the stuff that we threw out, they would never eat. But because when you're fishing streamer fishing, you're finding these aggressive fish, they kind of put caution uh, to the wind are on the side and they'll, they'll chase down streamers. And as a result, because you are engaged in that, that reactive predatory strike, 
you can get away fishing goat rope, you know, heavy diameter tippet. So that's that's a reference uh, to goat rope. Okay. Uh, next odd question. You take your shoes off and you climb into the casting ponds sometimes. Yeah. What's up with absolutely. that? Absolutely. Just, just, I just think it's uh, get a little. You put some fish yeah. in there, get that little fish pedicure going. They nibble your feet. Exactly. Look, I, I wear nothing but sandals because my my feet start sinking. So one, it's it's a way to clean out, you know, clean my feet and yes. make them smell better after I'm done. But then two, it, it just I don't know. I like being engaged uh, with with the audience and the group. And I think you know when you stand back there because the audience on these casting you know these casting platforms are spread all the way up and down. So what I like doing is. I like being engaged with the folks, so I'll I'll walk up and down the the casting pond uh, in my bare feet, you know, and, and t- you know talk about casting techniques, situ- whatever it is, but talk about the casting principles. But you know, walking around and, and looking at people in the eyes and, and engaging them and allowing them to see what I'm doing closer than what they would have to see if I I stood b- behind the the curtain, so to speak. So. It just I, I enjoy it when I whenever I do talks I, I like to be engaged with my with the audience so that's really the the reason why I do that. No worry about electrocution with your little headset. I guess there's not enough electricity in there. Maybe so, but I have a I have a great term life policy. With, so if if something happens to me, uh, my wife is going to be set for life. So it's uh <laughs> get a third third flycraft boat. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so what other shows do you have coming up this season? Uh, so I'm doing uh, every week. So I'm in I'm in Texas this weekend, uh, uh, the Guadalupe River Festival, and then you know the next weekend I'm in Arkansas, and Missouri, doing an event around St. Louis, and then going down to the White River to do some fishing, and also do a a little Q and A uh, in a small shop in Cotter, and then Lancaster. So long story short, every, I mean, my, luckily for me, business has, has been good. I'm I'm basically booked for 2017, everything from a guiding standpoint to a speaking presentation. So every weekend from here to the end of the year, I'm I'm somewhere at some city doing a talk or, or fishing. So it's it's great. I, I enjoy it. I love traveling. I like meeting new people and I like fishing new water. So it's it's been it's been a great life so far up to this point. Very cool. Uh, I guess my last question, if you had a, a superpower to help you be a, a better angler, any any superpowers you'd pick? The ability to talk to fish, simple as as simple as that. Because all, right. all we have right now are just theories. That's all you know. We 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 do tests, we do experiments, we have experiences that we kind of develop these theories, but they're never truly proven because people talk about low pressure systems, you know. And maybe there are some baselines. Same thing with moon phase, but there are always anomalies that you can say, well, you know, I, I've caught trout at night on a full moon and when people say you can't catch fish on a full moon so i would love to just be able to sit down and talk with fish not just trout but all fish and, and really hear what the hell is going on in their minds uh, and if i could do that i could probably write uh the book to end all books in fishing and then i could maybe retire i would love for you to interview i think it's a guppy in my aquarium it just swims into the tank and then like backwards and swims into the glass it's about as dumb as that chicken from moana <laughs> well, when I develop these these uh, six this sense to talk to fish, I will uh, I will come down and talk to the guppy. Absolutely, that's fantastic. All right, well, George, thank you so much for joining us, and I think we'll catch up and uh, see you in Lancaster. All right, thanks, Rob, so much. I appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. All right, well, take care and thank you again. This was awesome. Thank you. I've been trying to get you on for like two years now. Finally did it. Finally. All right. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you. Cheers. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us for the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast. For more information or to contact Rob, please go to www.robsnowwhite.com. And if you lack the strength of your own, honey, hold out your hands and take it from an old man. Freestyle Media.